Good morning, Detective O'Driscoll. Can you please introduce yourself to the court and explain your relation to this case? My name is Detective O'Driscoll. I've been with the Summit County Sheriff's Office for seven years. I'm assigned to the Investigations Division. I was assigned to be the lead, lead detective in this case in April of this year. This case is an active case and the investigation is ongoing. Detective, what was the Sheriff's Office first involvement in this case? On March 4th, 2022, at 322 hours, Summit County Dispatch received a 911 call regarding an unresponsive male in the Francis area. Have you listened to that 911 call? Yes. Who placed that call? The defendant, Corey Richens. In addition to saying <clears throat> that uh, someone was unresponsive, did Ms. Richens, the defendant, identify who was unresponsive and anything else about that person's condition? Yes, she stated that it was her husband, Eric Richens, that was unresponsive, that he was cold to the touch and not breathing. Did EMS and police respond to that address? Yes. Is that the family home? Yes. Was a portion of the police and EMS response captured on police body camera video? Yes, it was. Have you reviewed that video? Yes, I have. On that video, what time does EMS pronounce Eric Richens dead? 0358 hours on March 4th. What, if anything else, does EMS say about how long he had been dead? One of the EMS personnel made the comment that he had been dead a while. Did the state medical examiner's office conduct an autopsy of Mr. Richens? Yes, they did. Have you reviewed the medical examiner's autopsy report? Yes. And the toxicology report that's part of that? Yes. What did the medical examiner identify as the cause of death? Drug intoxication with the specific drug being fentanyl. I'm going to now ask you, detectives, some questions about someone with the initial CL. Do you know who I'm talking about when I say CL? Yes, I do. Who is CL in relation to the defendant? CL is an associate of the defendant. Uh, she cleaned houses for the defendant's business as well as her personal home at times. Does CL have a criminal drug history? Yes. Is she under supervision in a different county, a county other than Summit County? Yes, she is. And is that in relation to certain drug charges? Yes. Does the program, does the court program which she's in monitor treatment and testing, et cetera? Yes. Do you know how CL is performing in that program? Based on my interactions with CL, she is progressing through the stages of that program um, and that her personal outlook on her recovery is optimistic. Have you interviewed CL in connection with this case? Yes. Approximately how much time have you spent interviewing her? Over the course of multiple interviews, several hours each, I would say upwards of 10 hours. Was CL in uh, custody when you interviewed her? Yes, she was. Was that interview captured on video and audio recording? Yes. What, if any, promises did you make regarding C or to CL regarding her cooperation with being interviewed? CL was not made any specific promises, but at the outset of our interviews, we explained to her that her cooperation in our investigation would result in us working with the prosecutors that were responsible for the charges she was facing. Did you express to CL the seriousness of this case as well as the charges she was facing? Yes, we expressed to her the, the seriousness of the charges and the, the possible results of those charges. As well, we impressed upon her the importance or the value of her testimony in this case as, as it related to the charges that she was facing and that her testimony or any information that she may have was more important to us. Did you stress to CL that the information um, you were asking her about needed to be credible and verifiable? Yes, we, we told her at the beginning of our interview that any information that she may have, we would need to corroborate in order for it to be of value to us. Did CL cooperate with being interviewed? Yes, she did. Did CL know Eric Richens? Yes, CL told us that during the time that she spent cleaning the Richens' home, she got to know Eric, that she felt that he was a really good person, she liked him, and she was very saddened to hear that he had passed away. Did there come a time when investigators executed a search warrant on CL's home? Yes. In executing that warrant, did you make any observations consistent with CL's testimony that she felt bad about Eric Richens' death? Yes. Inside the home, we identified a bedroom that belonged to CL. In the bedroom, there was a mirror above a desk. 
uh, on the mirror were taped or affixed several inspirational quotes uh, that seemed to relate to her recovery and her drug court program. Amongst all those uh, inspirational quotes was a newspaper clipping of Eric Richens obituary. Did you get the impression that part of the reason CL cooperated is because she felt bad for Eric Richens? Yes, in fact, she said so many times in our interviews. Detective, I want to turn now to what, if anything, CL told you about the defendant requesting uh, that CL purchase fentanyl for the defendant. What did CL tell you? In our interviews, CL told us that in early 2022, the defendant reached out to her either by phone call or text message requesting that she procure fentanyl for what the defendant reported was a investor who had a back injury. And upon the defendant asking CL to get fentanyl, what did CL do? CL told us that she reached out to an acquaintance of hers, acquaintance one, and requested that she introduce her to somebody that could sell her fentanyl. Did acquaintance one introduce CL to someone that could sell CL fentanyl? Yes, CL said that acquaintance one provided her with a phone number of another acquaintance, acquaintance two, who was someone that she knew could sell CL fentanyl. And did CL say that she ultimately contacted acquaintance two? Yes, she did. What, if anything, did CL say about purchasing fentanyl from acquaintance two? CL told us that she contacted acquaintance two after receiving his phone number and asked to arrange to meet to purchase some fentanyl from him. She stated that sometime in February, she believed uh, she met up with acquaintance two at a Maverick gas station in Draper and purchased from him 15 to 30 round green-blue pills, which she understood to be fentanyl. Using phone records through the course of your interview with CL, were you ultimately able to narrow down on what that date was in February that CL purchased fentanyl from acquaintance two at the Maverick and Draper? Yes, based on uh, forensic evidence, we were able to determine that that date was February 11th, 2022. What, if anything, did CL say about what she did with the fentanyl pills that she purchased from acquaintance two? CL told us that after purchasing the pills from acquaintance two, she returned home to her house in Heber. She said that either later that night or the next day, the defendant met her in the driveway of that home and did a hand-to-hand -hand exchange of pills for cash. I'm going to turn now, detective, to some questions um, regarding witnesses who corroborate CL's testimony, OK? OK. You mentioned acquaintance number one. Have investigators interviewed acquaintance one? Yes. Have you reviewed body, camera, audio, and video of that interview? Yes. Does acquaintance one corroborate CL's testimony? Yes. She stated that CL contacted her in early 2022 and asked for someone that could sell her fentanyl. In the body cam, she also retrieves her cell phone and shows investigators the messages that corroborated that. And what kind of messages were they? They were messages between uh, acquaintance one and CL on Facebook Messenger app. And have you reviewed those messages? Yes. Is the first of those messages dated February 6, 2022 at 1.37 PM? Yes. Does it read, text me, I've got a question, won't do it on this? Yes. And that's CL <coughs> writing acquaintance one, asking acquaintance one to text CL because she didn't want to write over Facebook Messenger? Correct. Did Acquaintance one say whether or not she ever, in response, uh, contacted CL? Yes, she said that she then either texted or called her sub subsequent to her request. You testified that acquaintance two sold fentanyl pills to CL at the Maverick and Draper. Have investigators interviewed acquaintance two? Yes. Have you reviewed body camera audio and video of that interview? Yes, I have. Is acquaintance two able to co corroborate CL's testimony? Yes, acquaintance two was able to recall that he sold fentanyl pills to a friend of acquaintance one's in early 2022 at a Maverick gas station in Draper. I'm going to turn out detective to some forensic data questions um, and whether forensic data corroborates CL's narrative, okay? Okay. Um, have you reviewed carrier records of the defendant's phone? Yes. 
and I want to just clarify one thing. I'm talking right now about carrier records, different than cell data records. Um, we'll have an expert testify about cell data records in a moment. I'm just going to ask you about the carrier records, okay? Okay. Um, what, if anything, do the carrier records for the defendant's phone, um, or what, if anything, in the carrier records for a defendant's phone corroborate CL's testimony? The, the cell records from the defendant's phone show several phone calls back and forth between her and CL in early 2022. Do they show any text messages back and forth between the defendant and CL? Yes, several. Have you reviewed those text messages? We were only able to see the timestamps and who the sender and receiver was. We we're not able to see the content of those messages because they appear to be deleted from both the defendant's phone and CL's phone. Have you reviewed the call history and carrier records of CL's phone? Yes. Does CL's carrier records and call history corroborate CL's testimony? Yes. Is there a particular um, set of calls on February 11th, 2022, between 5.19 p.m. and 6.52 p.m. in CL's phone history? Yes. Did you question CL um, regarding those calls? Yes. She said those calls were to acquaintance two and that they were to arrange the specific date and time to pick up fentanyl in Draper. Turning now from CL's purchasing fentanyl for the defendant to the defendant's purported timeline on the night of Eric Richen's death, OK? OK. Um, you mentioned earlier that police interactions with the defendant were captured on video. Have you reviewed that video? Yes, I have. Did the defendant provide police with a written statement in the early morning of March 4th, 2022? Yes, she did. Have you reviewed that statement? Yes. What on the early morning of Eric Richen's death did the defendant report had happened that evening? She stated that the last time that she saw Eric alive was between 9.30 and 9.45 p.m. She stated that before going to bed, they had had a drink together to celebrate uh, closing on a house for her business. She said that they got in bed between 9.30 and 9.45, and that shortly after getting into bed, one of the children had a nightmare and that the defendant got out of bed and went to be with that child in their bedroom and slept in that bedroom until 3 a.m. or around 3 a.m. when she woke. She stated she returned to her own bedroom, got into bed, and felt that Eric was cold to the touch. She stated that she turned the light on, saw that he wasn't breathing and that he didn't look normal, and that she then called 911. Did the defendant say whether anyone else was in their home other than the defendant her husband, Eric Richens, and their three young children? No, she stated no one else was in the home. Turning now to the defendant's statements regarding whether she performed CPR on her husband, OK? OK. Um, did, the, did the defendant tell investigators when they arrived at her home shortly after she called 911 whether or not she performed CPR on Eric Richens? Yes, she reported that she did. I'm going to refer to someone now as defendant's best friend. Do you know who I'm talking about? Yes. What, if anything, did the defendant tell her best friend regarding whether she performed CPR on Eric Richens? Investigators found text messages between the defendant and her best friend that uh, was her explanation to her friend that she conducted CPR on Eric prior to EMS arrival. And do those text messages read, I pumped so damn hard so hard, screaming at him to come back to life? Yes. You testified earlier, Detective, that EMS responded. Have you interviewed the uh, first EMS responder? Yes, I have. What observations did that EMS responder make? They told me that when they arrived, they began CPR compressions on Eric, and that upon Beginning those compressions, Eric began to foam at the mouth. He stated that that observation indicated that CPR was not likely conducted before he arrived. Detective, as part of your investigation, did you look into whether Eric Richens used illicit drugs? Yes. What did you determine? 
based on the interviews that we conducted with those who knew Eric well, um, all stated that he did not use illicit drugs other than consuming THC gummies on occasion. Do those that you spoke to include Eric's two best friends that he's known since high school? Yes, both made the same statement, that they never knew Eric to use any illicit substances other than the THC gummies. When I reference a hunting guide in Mexico by the initials um, TR, do you know who I'm referring to? Yes. Did you speak to this hunting guide? Uh, other Summit County detectives did, yes. And what did this hunting guide, if anything, say about Eric Richens using illicit drugs while hunting in Mexico? The guide told detectives that several of their clients, when they come to Mexico, will seek out someone that can put them in contact with illicit substances while they are down there for their hunt. He stated that Eric Richens was not one of these, that Eric was solely focused on the hunt. Has the defendant made any statements regarding whether her husband, Eric Richens, used illicit drugs other than THC? Yes, in several statements made by the defendant throughout the investigation, there have been at least 10 times that she has said that Eric does not use illicit substances and did not use illicit substances. And just to be clear, other than THC? Other than the THC gummies, correct. On the night uh, Eric Richens died, did investigators search the Richens' home? Yes. Did they find any illicit drugs? No. Did they find any paraphernalia or packaging or other evidence of illicit drugs? No. Did they find fentanyl anywhere in the home? Only that which was in Eric's body. I'm going to now shift, uh, Detective, from the night of Eric's death to a second drug buy initiated before his death and concluded after his death, okay? Okay. What, if anything, did CL tell you about the defendant approaching CL a second time for fentanyl? CL told us that approximately a week after delivering the first load of fentanyl, the defendant reached out to her again by text or, or call and said that she wanted some more fentanyl that was stronger than the previous batch. And in, in response, what, if anything, did CL do? CL told us that she again reached out to acquaintance one um, because she had lost the phone number for acquaintance two and again requested from acquaintance one that she provide her with the phone number for acquaintance two. She also made other statements in Facebook messages uh, regarding that request. In your interview, or detective's interview rather, with acquaintance one, did she corroborate that indeed CL reached back out to her asking for acquaintance two's phone number? Yes, in the same Facebook messenger, it, it showed the two different contacts on the two different dates. And does the second Facebook message, um, was it dated February 25th, 2022 at 9.40 p.m.? Yes. And does it read, I need those again, but more, and I don't got a ride, I lost your friend's number? Correct. Did CL and acquaintance one both say that acquaintance one provided CL's, CL with acquaintance, acquaintance two's phone number again? Yes. What then, if anything, did CL do with acquaintance to his phone number the second time. CL told us that she again contacted acquaintance two and arranged again to meet up at the same Maverick gas station in Draper to purchase again 15 to 30, this time blue round pills that she understood to be fentanyl. Between, uh, on the way to the Draper and Maverick, the second time when she purchased 15, I'm sorry, did you say 15 to 30? What? Yes, 15 to 30 pills which she believed to be fentanyl. Did she make any stops along the way? Yes, CL told us that the second time that she procured fentanyl for the defendant, she did not have a vehicle to drive on that date. She said that she reached out to a friend, acquaintance three, and asked that he give her a ride to go purchase fentanyl. She said that he did pick her up, that they traveled from Heber City to the defendant's home in Francis, where according to CL, the defendant had told her there was a check waiting under the mat at the defendant's home. She said that she checked under the mat and didn't find a check, and so she knocked on the defendant's door, and the defendant came to the door and wrote her a check from her business, from the defendant's business, for $1,300 for the purchase of the fentanyl. CL told us that afterwards, they 
drove to the America First Credit Union in Heber City, where the where CL banks, and cashed the check, and deposited three hundred dollars of it into her account at America First Credit Union. She said that after stopping at the bank and getting the cash, they then drove to the Maverick gas station in Draper and purchased the pills from acquaintance too. Did investigators execute a warrant at the America First Credit Union um, in Heber? Yes, and that warrant returned a copy of the check written from the defendant's business account in the name of CL and a receipt that shows that it was cashed and that $300 were deposited into CL's account. And then CL ultimately, being driven by Acquaintance 3, went to the Draper in, sorry, went to the Maverick in Draper and purchased fentanyl a second time from Acquaintance 2. Correct. What, if anything, does Acquaintance 2 say that corroborates CL's testimony? Acquaintance 2, in his interview, stated that he remembered selling fentanyl to a friend of Acquaintance 1's on two separate occasions at the same Maverick gas station in Draper. He also said that he remembered the second time that he sold her the pills that CL was with another person who matched the age and gender of Acquaintance 3. Have you interviewed Acquaintance 3? Yes. What, if anything, does Acquaintance 3 say to corroborate CL's testimony? Acquaintance 3 corroborated all the same details that CL told us about that day, and in fact, showed us text messages on his phone that also corroborated that story. Detective, I'm going to ask you now some questions about what are commonly known as bug out bags, okay? Okay. Um, did investigators execute several search warrants on the defendant's home or the family home? Yes. Um, did those warrants identify what are commonly known as bug out bags? Yes. There were several uh, duffel bags stored in the garage along with uh, backpack sized day packs and each was identical and labeled for a different member of the Richens family. Um, those backpacks were seized subject to a warrant and were inventoried and photographed. Inside the bags, uh, detectives located several items that would be useful in an emergency situation, um, but the most interesting were tr uh, documents needed for travel for each member of the family. Uh, each bag contained a photocopy of a state-issued ID in the children's case, along with uh, passports for Eric and the defendant, as well as global entry travel cards for both Eric and the defendant. Did those bags also contain clothing, toiletries, that kind of thing? Yes. Do detectives know when those bags were packed? No. And there was a bag for Eric as well, is that right? Correct. I have no further questions for you. Mr. Lazar on mine. Thank you. Oh, it's O'Driscoll, right? Correct. Good morning. Good morning. I'm going to follow a little bit the, the same timeline just so or we kind of keep things uh, together. Uh, you said you reviewed the body cam uh, that was provided on the night uh, that Eric passed away, correct? Correct. Okay. And that um, Corey made a statement that night to police, a written statement. Correct. Okay. And she told them that she had made a drink, correct? Correct. Okay. So they were aware of that. Um, was there anything in that body cam or investigation uh, that talks about them looking for a glass that a drink had been made in? No. Okay. Um, but you said that they searched for illicit drugs, correct? I don't know if they searched for illicit drugs, but they searched the home. Okay. So they searched the home that night knowing that he had a drink right before he went to bed uh, and made no note that they had recovered glasses, looked for glasses, anything along those lines, correct? Not to my understanding. Okay. Um, you also testified that when you interviewed CL, she was working uh, on both a personal and, I'm going to say, professional capacity for Corey, correct? Correct. And she was cleaning houses um, that she was both cleaning Corey's personal home and then she would clean homes uh, that were uh, investment properties, correct? CL told us that she cleaned both homes for Ms. Richens' business 
as well as at another time frame, she cleaned their personal home. Okay. So not necessarily at the same time. But at the time, she was cleaning homes for the business, correct? Which time are you referring to? Uh, on or about uh, the time leading up to or during your investigation, end of the year, end of 2021, beginning of 2022. At, at that time, from my understanding, what CL told us, she was cleaning only investment properties belonging to the Richens Realty Company. And she was getting compensated for that, correct? Yes. Okay, and so the check that you issued the search warrant on for the bank, that was written from Corey's business account, correct? Correct. Okay, so it could very well be that Corey was paying her for cleaning houses, correct? I don't want to speculate, but... It could be, it's despite possible. what CL said, correct? Okay. Um, you also testified that um, CL was progressing through her drug court program and, and you were optimistic about how she would do in it, correct? No, I testified that she was optimistic about her own personal Sorry, recovery. Sorry, that. How long uh, were you investigating CL? When did you begin investigating CL? I don't know an exact date, but the beginning of 2023. Okay. And were you monitoring what she was doing at that time? Yes. Okay. Um, because you knew she had a boyfriend or this guy in Vegas, some other details about her life, correct? Uh, initially at the outset of investigating CL, no, we didn't know all those details. But over the course of your investigation, you learned them? Correct. Did you, you have CL's phone, correct? Summit County Sheriff's Office evidence texts do. But you've reviewed it? Yes. Okay. And you testified about text messages between CL and the defendant uh, on or about this time period you're looking at in February, correct? Correct. Okay. Did you uh, review any other information prior to that time about contact that CL and the defendant had had? I'm unsure. Did you even but look? it's possible that we looked into communications. In, in this investigation, initial stages, we looked into communications with everybody that the defendant had been communicating with. Okay. But you don't, you don't recall or you didn't look for a pattern of communication between CL and the defendant, is that correct? You were focused on February? I guess that depends on what, in what stages of the investigation you're talking about. I'm talking about any of them. Did you ever look and see if CL and the defendant texted each other about anything on a regular basis? Yes. Okay. And how far back did those go? I'm not sure on exact dates again, but into 2021. Okay. So for a period of time, because CL is working for the defendant, there's communication, correct? Correct. Okay. And nowhere in the communication between CL and defendant are there any text messages asking for drugs, correct? We didn't find any. But there were also gaps in time frames in the phones okay. when we looked at them. Now, I want to also talk about, you said you didn't make any promises uh, to CL, is that correct? Correct, no specific promises. Okay. You did, however, tell her, let me back up. When was the first inter interview you had with CL? I believe it was April 28th or 26th. Okay. I believe it was the 26th. Did you have any contact with her prior to that? No. Did anybody from law enforcement have contact with her prior to that? N not from our office. You don't know if anyone else talked to her? I don't. Okay. Now part of this, uh, came out of a raid or, or something along the lines that was coordinated with at least ATF and some other agencies, correct? CL's home was subject to a search warrant based on information that we had gathered during our investigation into CL. Okay. And that search warrant would essentially contradict that she was doing well and what she was supposed to be doing in drug court, correct? She was buying drugs, wasn't she? We didn't know that. We knew that she was associating with people that we knew had active warrants for drug charges. Okay, and that would be a violation of drug court conditions, correct? From my understanding, yes, but I don't know the details of that. 
Okay. And as part of that search warrant, were uh, individuals arrested? CL was arrested, yes. There were other individuals who were arrested too, correct? I'm not recalling other individuals that were arrested on the date that this, the warrant was served. Okay. Were any drugs recovered at the home? Yes. Okay. And you also recovered a firearm uh, from CL's bedroom, correct? Correct. And that would be a violation of her drug court conditions, correct? Correct. Now, in this first interview in, in April, you begin the interview. By explaining to CL essentially how dire of a situation she's in, correct? I don't have the interview memorized, but I know we talked about that, yes. Okay, well, you told her that she was on probation to drug court for four first-degree felonies, correct? Correct. Okay, a violation of that is a potential prison sentence, correct? It would depend on the prosecutor, but that's potentially true. Okay, a first-degree felony carries uh, a possible penalty of life in prison, correct? I don't know. I would have to reference the code. Okay. Um, so you also, so you told her she was facing problems with that, correct? That right. this would be a violation. So she'd be on the hook for four first degree felonies. Potentially, yes. Okay. And you also told her that having the firearm um, could potentially be a new crime, correct? Correct. Okay. And then you also told her that the U.S. Attorney's Office uh, was essentially on board with screening uh, drug distribution charges, correct? I'm happy to play it if you don't remember. I don't remember specifically. Okay. Do you remember talking to her about potential federal charges? Yes. Okay. So she was aware that not only was she facing multiple first degree felony prison sentences, she was also potentially facing federal charges, correct? Correct. Okay. And during that initial interview, she tells you uh, that she didn't buy fentanyl, correct? I don't know if she made that specific statement, but she she talked about not knowing anything about fentanyl. Okay. And that interview lasted about an hour and 19 minutes, hour and 20 minutes, correct? Correct. Okay. When that interview ends, well, with you telling her, well, several times you tell her, to think through all of this and let you know if she wants to help, correct? Yes, I gave her the opportunity to tell us up front whether she was willing to cooperate or if we should just not bother interviewing her anymore. Okay. But this is after you essentially tell her that she has the potential of doing a considerable amount of state and federal prison time, potentially. Yes, this is a common tactic in law enforcement to be able to leverage charges for information. Okay. In fact, you did in this case leverage charges for information because you told her that you didn't care about first degree felonies or federal charges. What you cared about was information about Corey getting drugs, correct? I told her that I was interested in the information that she may know about this case. Okay. And, but you told her also that Eric died of a fentanyl overdose, correct? Correct. And you told her that you thought that Corey gave him the drugs, correct? I did not specifically say that. You alluded to the fact that you needed information about Corey getting fentanyl because that's how Eric died, correct? I don't know if I made that specific statement, but the information that we tried to convey to CL was that we wanted to know the information that she may have regarding Eric's death. Okay. And... You didn't care about any additional charges, all you cared about was that information, correct? As I said previously, we expressed to her that the information that she may have was more valuable to us than seeking charges against her. Okay. All right. And then you interview her two more times, is that right? No, there were, I believe, three more after our first one. Okay. Were all of those uh, audio and video recorded? Yes. And those were turned over to uh, the state in this case, correct? The state being the prosecutor's office? Okay.
Now, <clears throat> forgive me because with all these interviews, I'm not sure which one comes from which. Um, you, in subsequent interviews, tell CL that she needs to give good enough details that will ensure that Corey gets convicted of murder, correct? I don't know if I made that specific statement, but I did express to her that the information that she gave us needed to be specific enough that we could corroborate it and that it could be presented to a courtroom. Okay, and that she was, quote, screwed at this point for a minute or a few years if there's not cooperation, correct? No, I never made such statement. Okay. Did you ever tell her this was her get out of jail free card? No, I did not. Okay. Are you sure about that? Yes. Okay. Now, at some point, CL tells you that in one of the interviews that Corey contacted her between December and February to obtain prescription pills for an investor, correct? Correct. Okay. And she doesn't specifically state fentanyl at that point, correct? Are you referring to CL? I'm referring to CL. I don't remember, but I don't believe so. Okay. And in fact, in, I'm guessing it's something where around the second or third interview, um, CL says that those first pills, well, never says those first pills are fentanyl, correct? It never says that Corey asked for fentanyl, correct? I'm sorry, could you rephrase the question? Sorry. In, in, in those first, in the, the first transaction, so initially, CL tells you that there were three transactions prior to Eric's death, correct? Yes, and what I have to say here is that- Well, I'm just, that was a yes or no question but none of the information that we got from CL was perfectly chronological. We had to piece it together over multiple interviews to come to the conclusion that we came to. Because you told her you needed more, something more specific to ensure that Corey gets convicted, right? No, we told her that we needed more details on what she was talking about and specific dates and times. Okay. But in the first one, she says there's three transactions prior to Eric's death, correct? At, at some point in our interviews, she told us that there were three total transactions. Okay. And she says that Corey was only looking for prescription pills or hydrocodone pills, to be specific, correct? CL referred to them as Roxy's. Okay, what do you know Roxy's to be? They can be different things in the drug world. They can either be counterfeit pills that are meant to look like a prescription pill, or they can be actual prescription pills, but generally they're known to be opiate-based uh, drugs, whether illicit or pharmaceutical. Okay, so something along the lines of hydrocodone or Oxycontin or something along those lines, correct? It could be, yes. Okay. And she specifically says that she was looking for $900 worth of fentanyl pills, correct? I don't know if initially, but she did make the statement of $900 at, at one point in one of our interviews. Okay. And she says that Corey told her to leave the pills at an outdoor fire pit at the Midway House where there was cash, correct? I don't know if she made the, that exact statement, but yes, she told us that at some point in part of the exchange that she was instructed to leave pills in an outdoor fire pit in a house in Midway. Okay. And in fact, you sat there with her in this interview and did house searches, correct? Trying to figure out which house this was. Yes. Okay. Because um, she couldn't really tell you which house it was, correct? She couldn't give us an address, but she was confident that she could find it if she could drive there. Okay. And did you take her for a drive there? Yes. Okay. Did you ever do any follow-up investigation on uh, whether or not that house uh, ever sold? Yes. Okay. And you know that that house sold sometime in January of 2022, correct? From what I understand, yes. Okay. So Ms. Richens no longer owned that home or <coughs> occupied that home or had access to that home in February, correct? I don't know. Well, the house was owned by somebody else, right? Again, I don't know. Well, you said it closed in January of 2022. From the information that I was told from other people, other investigators that had looked into that, I was told that Ms. Richens owned the house at some point and that it sold at some point. I don't know dates exactly. Okay, don't you think that date would be important if 
uh, Seals telling you that she had access to the home and was there in February? Possibly. That might be a good fact to know. Okay. CL then does subsequent interviews, correct? Yes, we had multiple interviews with her. Okay. Um, and after being told that she needs to be more specific, as your words are, correct, she now says that uh, it was specifically fentanyl that Corey asked for, correct? Correct. Okay. And that she didn't actually take the pills to that house in Midway. It was a hand-to-hand -hand transaction, correct? Like I said, she went back and forth on her memory on which instances referred to which transactions. And ultimately, she told us that she was sure that the first, the first transaction of fentanyl was a hand-to-hand -hand transaction in her driveway. OK. And was what's been referred to as acquaintance three, was that in regard to that transaction? No, okay. was the second transaction. Were you ever to corroborate, was anyone with her that could corroborate that she saw CL hand Corey drugs? Not that I know of. Okay. And then she states that now there was a, a third transaction that occurred after Eric's death, correct? She didn't make the statement that it was after Eric's death, but she told us there were three total transactions. Okay. So the information contained in the state's amended information, you don't know where that came from? Which information are you that referring to? That she purchased drugs after Eric's death. Yes, I do know where it came from. OK. Um, and you're saying CL did not sell drugs to Corey after Eric's death? CL could not remember specific dates and did not make mention that the transaction happened after Eric's death. But when presented with digital evidence from other witnesses, she confirmed that that was most likely correct. OK. So she just agreed with your scenario of events, correct? No. In fact, several times during our interview, she told us that as we presented her more information, it helped her remember more. OK. So as you're telling her to be more specific, you're providing her with information that you're gaining in the case, and she's saying, now I remember. Accurate? Yes. All right. You also testified that you interviewed uh, two of Eric's best friends, right? Yes. Okay. And during one of those interviews, So I'm going to go back to, to CL for just a second. On this transaction that you allege that this check was used for, or the state alleges this check was used for, you testified that she picked up the check that was written on Corey's business account and cashed it, right? Correct. And drove to the Maverick and purchased fentanyl. She didn't drive, but she was Someone driving. drove her, yes. okay? And, and the person with her corroborates that. Correct. Uh, and that, that third witness never saw CL give those drugs to Corey, correct? Acquaintance 3 never saw that? Acquaintance 3 didn't tell us that he ever saw that, no. OK. Um, in fact, there's no independent witness to corroborate that CL gave Mr. Corey those drugs, correct? No eyewitnesses that we have identified, but the investigation is ongoing. Correct. And CL is currently out of custody, right? Depends on your definition of custody, but she's not incarcerated, no. Not incarcerated. She's on, I think, Eagle Monitor and not to leave the county, right? Correct. But following your interviews with her, she was released from jail? Not immediately, no. She worked with the prosecutor in the other county where her drug court is and came to a resolution as to those charges against her. And part of that was being released on ankle monitor. OK. So in exchange for the testimony, or in, not testimony, in exchange for the information that she provided to you, and a deal was worked out where she was placed 
essentially released from jail on the order to show cause, correct? I don't know the specifics of what went on between the prosecutor and CO, okay. but subsequent to our interviews, we reached out to the prosecutor's office and let them know that she was being cooperative. After that, I was not involved in any decisions regarding her release. Okay, because that's up to the judge and whatnot. Correct. But but you did communicate that to prosecutors? Yes. That she gave you the information you needed? That she was being cooperative with our investigation, yes. All right, I want to turn now to your interview, and, and I'm going to use initials, are you okay? Um, you had an, an interview with um, one of Eric's friends. Uh, his initials are JS. Do you recall that? Yes. Okay. That interview occurred about April 20th. Is that correct? That seems right. I don't know a specific date, but. Okay. And during that interview, he discussed, or you discussed with him, um, that he and another individual were essentially Eric's best friends, correct? Ms. Lozera, my apologies. Yes. April 20th of which year? Oh, 2023. Three. I apologize. Thank you. Um, at any point during that interview, did JS mention uh, that Eric had said that at any point during he and Corey's marriage, he was concerned that uh, Corey was attempting to poison him? I don't recall, but I don't think so. Okay. In fact, you present him essentially three scenarios of what could have happened to Eric, correct? That he potentially did it to himself, knowingly, that someone else did it to him, uh, or that it was accidental, right? Okay. And you specifically ask him if he thinks Corey would have done it, and he says, no, in my gut, I don't believe so, correct? I don't know if that was a direct quote, but yes, he said that he didn't believe that she would have done it. And he also states during that interview that at the time of his death, Eric and Corey's marriage was in a really good place. Yes. Correct? Now he also details or, or talks about um, a falling out that he and Eric had had uh, over the course of their friendship, correct? Yes, that sounds familiar. Okay. And that Eric and his other friend uh, that he refers to in this interview actually had a falling out right before Eric passed away, correct? Yes. Okay. Um, <laughs> also talk about, uh, or he talks about uh, the fact that, you know, all three of them at different times had had marital problems, that they had helped each other through, correct? JS told me told me that he and Eric and their other friend would confide in each other uh, about their marriages and uh, would share information. And that was, that was how he had the insight that he had into to Eric's life. Okay. He also talks about um, that <laughs> Eric changed uh, or created these trust documents, correct? Correct. And his understanding, based on what he said that Eric told him, uh, was because <clears throat> Eric was pissed or upset um, about a relationship that Corey had had, correct? Or he thought he, she had. I don't remember the specifics of that, that part of the interview, but I do remember that JS was aware that Eric had made the trust. Okay. And he doesn't specifically say anywhere in that interview that the trust was made because he was mad about this home equity loan, correct? JS expressed to us that he understood that the reason that Eric created the trust was to ensure his son's well-being if anything were to happen to him. Okay. Um, and he also expresses to you that uh, because you ask him why it wasn't changed back, or be because the, the sister was made the trustee, correct? And I'm, I'm sorry, I don't understand the question. The sister, so in those trust documents, sorry, that was a terrible question. In those trust documents, the sister was made the trustee, correct? From what I understand, yes. And you asked JS specifically, or somewhere along the lines of, if they were doing so well, why would he have not changed that back? Right? Yes. Okay. <laughs> and he tells you uh, that, 
it was his way of ensuring that even if they were doing well at the time, if there was a divorce, he would get the last word in it, right? I, I remember him using that phrase, getting the last word, yes. Now you also testified today about this hunt that took place uh, down in Mexico, right? Correct. And this hunt was February of 2022, correct? I don't know specific dates, but I'm aware that Eric was on a hunt in Mexico shortly before his death. Okay. And JS tells you uh, that he was really upset, uh, actually, leading in the days right before he passed away about what had happened with this hunt, right? Yes. And uh, he was upset that they had paid an outfitter uh, for a number of permits uh, that they believed the outfitter had procured, correct? correct? Yes, from what, I'm, from what I'm recalling, he was upset about the outfitter or the guide had not gotten enough permits for the amount of animals that they ended up taking, and it caused some concerns over uh, legal requirements of tagging animals. Okay. And getting the cape or anything else, correct? Correct. Okay. And this is the same... Uh, is this outfitter the person that you investigated or that you interviewed? Someone associated with that hunt and that outfit, yes. I'm not sure the exact association, but a contact for that outfitter. Okay. So that outfitter was aware that they had made some serious problems uh, for Eric with regard to how many animals they took in Mexico, correct? According to JS, yes. Okay. <laughs> and in your subsequent investigation, uh, you know that Eric had had... Um, some heated conversations actually the night uh, before he passed or the night that he passed away with that outfitter, correct? We received information about that, yeah. Okay. In fact, he was searching how far it was to drive from Scottsdale down there, correct? Correct. Okay. Well, his phone showed that search. Okay. And JS also told you that he had information or believed that this outfitter was somehow connected to the cartel, correct? I don't recall. That, that sounds familiar, but I don't recall if those were the words that he used. But essentially, he was he made, he made a, he, JS made a statement about the cartel when he was talking about Eric and that hunt, yes. Okay. Counsel, would you approach for a minute? Yes. 